Okay, good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon to um, our online audience and our in-person audience. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Uh, welcome to our special event this afternoon on Why Democracy Matters, a conversation with Ambassador Derek Mitchell. I I'm really thrilled we're doing this, and I'm grateful to, to you, Derek, for, uh, for coming up to Providence today. Uh, as I said, I'm really delighted to welcome our distinguished guest, Ambassador Derek Mitchell, who has served as president of the National Democratic Institute since 2018. Uh, Derek Mitchell served from 2012 to 2016 as U.S. Ambassador to Myanmar uh, during the Obama administration. Derek was the first U.S. Ambassador to, to Myanmar, to Burma, in 22 years up to that point. More recently, he worked with the Biden White House on the Summit for Democracy, which was held uh, just last December. Earlier in, her, in his distinguished career, Ambassador Mitchell had served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, mm -hmm. uh, overseeing the DOD's security policy in Northeast, Southeast, South, and Central Asia. Ambassador Mitchell, uh, as is certainly familiar to me, is also a, a highly accomplished scholar, have, having written two books on China during his time as a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Today's event is, uh, is going to be held in a discussion format, and it's going to be done with Watson's own Brian Atwood serving as, uh, as the interviewer and, and discussant. Uh, for the few of you in person and online who don't know Brian already or haven't had the benefit of taking courses with him, uh, Brian served as a senior fellow and visiting scholar at the Watson Institute since 2016. But that came after a distinguished career in public service, diplomacy, and education, among many other accomplishments. Brian served as the director of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, during the Clinton administration, and prior to that, had served as Under Secretary of State for Management. Uh, Brian had also served as Assistant Secretary of State for Congressional Relations during the Carter administration, and of course, Brian had also served as Dean of the University of Minnesota's Hubert Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Uh, for the event today, uh, Derek and Brian will be in conversation for 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions for our in-person audience, but also for our online audience. For those of you uh, watching online, please, please feel free to uh, type in your questions online, and those will be relayed uh, to, to, the, to the panel. Great. And with that, let me turn it over to you, Brian. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Ed, and uh, I really welcome uh, Derek Mitchell here. Give you a little bit of background before I turn it over to him and ask him a few leading questions. But <clears throat> Derek, uh, I, I take some responsibility for Derek being the president of NDI <laughs> since I was on the search committee, and Certainly I think do. He, he chose the right person. But in reflecting back on uh, the beginnings of NDI, when I was uh, the first president of NDI, I had a staff of four, and uh, I, that meant that NDI was a, a collective of uh, five people. And uh, we were at a time when uh, authoritarians around the world were kind of on their back foot. They didn't quite know how to deal with, with us. And we managed to, to use those five people, interestingly, uh, to topple a few dictators, including uh, the Philippines, uh, Marcos, and, uh, and Pinochet in Chile, by holding uh, election observer missions which, of course, turned out to be fraudulent in the case of the Philippines and, and created a people power revolution. And then Pinochet didn't take, uh, uh, didn't take a chapter out of that book uh, to read it, I guess, because we, he allowed us to come in there as well. We worked with the opposition, and in the end, in a plebiscite, uh, Pinochet lost. Then all hell broke loose because the Soviet Union and, uh, and uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe broke, broke open. And, we were all over the place there, including in places like Ukraine, which I know is uh, on the minds of a lot of people today. Um, Derek uh, had actually, one of the things that he had done earlier in his life was also to work at NDI on Asia matters, I think. Mm -hmm. right? Mostly. A little bit more formal. Um, he, uh, he was in places like Burma, mm -hmm. Myanmar, at really important stages, and we now know what's going on there. But the world has changed since the authoritarians were on their back foot when I was the, uh, the president of NDI. To, uh, I, 
Bill Derrick this in trying to recruit him to convince him to take this job. It was the best job I've ever had, including the state and NIV jobs that I've later had, uh, because it was so exciting. But I'm not so sure it's so exciting anymore. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been on the board, so I've been very watching very closely. And of course, uh, Eric Derrick has had to evacuate some 350 people out of Afghanistan and is now in the process of evacuating people out of Ukraine. Um, the authoritarians are no longer on their back foot. Um, however, they may have taken a step too far. We'll see. The subject of what Derek wants to talk about initially is why democracy matters. And I'm going to ask him to reflect on that issue now in light of all of these things that are going on. And then there's a whole menu of things we want to ask him about. And I encourage people who are watching to, uh, to also ask questions, and we'll have plenty of time for those later. Uh, but let's start with why democracy matters, Derek. Well, first of all, thank you to everybody here in the room and anybody watching on YouTube uh, for this opportunity. Thank you to Brown and the Watson, Watson Institute. Brian, it's great to be sitting next to you. Um, when I first worked at NDI in the 90s, I just started after you had just left. And so you were kind of an icon uh, that you were founder, basically the originator of NDI, and we were all sort of following your footsteps. And it's really been wonderful to get to know you. And, uh, and it is still very exciting to be at NDI, but not in the same way that you experienced it, unfortunately. It's exciting for some of the uh, unhappy reasons. Ed, as well, great to see you again, and thank you for inviting me. Um, why democracy matters. I think, you know, originally, as, we t uh, as Brian suggested, in the 1990s, you know, um, and I just, I just had an interview with a student here for the, the journal. And the last question I was asked is, what, what is your message, final message to students and others now? And it just occurred to me that I started uh, graduate school. My graduate school years were 1989 to 1991. Uh, and those were, my first semester was when the Berlin Wall fell. And I left just as the New World Order was taking shape. That was George H.W. Bush's term. And the Soviet Union was on its last legs, was about to go. And so we knew they were on the cusp of something remarkable. It was an optimistic moment. It was a shocking moment in some ways that this could be happening uh, at this time. It was also the moment of the end of history. You know, of course, the poor Frank Fukuyama, who will never live that down, but uh, a triumphant moment where democracy was on the ascendant and, and, and history had ended. We knew where history was moving. We just needed to water it a bit plant the seeds, water it, and it will sprout over time. And that's how NDI was. NDI was back in the 90s when I was there. Matter of planting seeds, sprouting, letting people get the understanding over generations, and it will sprout. Right now, we are at a different moment. The cusp, so the students now are at the cusp of what I would call the new world disorder. Um, you know, a, a different moment in time where, in some ways, a clarifying moment. Um, and it gets to why democracy matters. Um, we've taken democracy in some ways for granted all these years as Americans, for those of us who are Americans, not everyone here will be American, um, but elsewhere, that this is just going to happen. Uh, either it's inevitable or it, it just, uh, we don't have to work at it in the United States, it just simply is. Um, and we've seen over the past 15 years at least, 10, 15 years, the rise of others who have uh, gone after democracy, either from outside, whether it's Chinese or Russians or others, or from within, uh, trying to undermine democratic, the real democracy. So you have dem democracy in form, but not really in fact. Uh, trying to grab power, use, maintain power in corrupt means, going through the process of elections but not actually having elections reflect the will of the people. And we've seen steady degradation of societies. And you've seen some of these actors globally look at us and say they are weak, they are divided, and democracy doesn't work. And we could take advantage of this. We can use this to our benefit. We can go in there and we can subvert. We can play games to undermine these societies from outside. Um, the idea that history is ever over, um, we have to get over that fighting for democracy and fighting for freedom versus autocrats and first those who want to control is always going to be the case. 
uh, throughout human history as long as human beings are on this earth, the fight for control versus the fight for freedom uh, and, and democracy. Why does it matter? We're seeing why democracy matters on the front pages now. If Russia were a democracy, we wouldn't be seeing what's, what happened, what's going on right now. Um, number one, the, the Russian people are not interested in this. They only are interested, they're only maybe interested if they're not getting the information they need to make a rational choice. But they have connections to Ukraine, and democracies tend to focus on their own internal issues, on their own development, um, and on their own rights rather than uh, seeking to create an imperium. It's the autocrats that go to war for an imperium um, and who fight against this. Demo democracies don't fight democracies. They don't go to war with these things. We also know that democracies uh, are able to self-correct. When they make mistakes, they're able to self-correct. They're able to judge when things are going badly. And uh, there are systems that enable for accountability uh, so that there is sort of a balance of power between media or parliaments and executives. Um, and so that uh, leaders get the information they need to hear, not just what they want to hear or others want them to hear. They need to be responsive to citizens. If there's a regular accountability mechanism, an election of some kind or a media that's on them, um, they will have to be responsive to citizen needs, which is why in every study, democracy, uh, democracies are shown to provide better outcomes, deliver better on health, education, peace, and development. And the studies are saying it all, that democracies deliver better health outcomes, educational outcomes, development outcomes, and are the essential component to lasting peace, to bring together disparate, divided societies. And if you were to say to anybody, I can give you one factor that will give you better health, education, peace, and development outcomes, you would think we need to put that at the center of our foreign policy. We need to have that at the center of a society. And that is democracy. That doesn't make it, make it easy. Doesn't mean the transition to democracy, which we're also finding in studies, usually leads to a little bit more unrest and more uh, instability. But de the democratic values themselves of transparency, accountability, inclusion, and representation, responsiveness, that's what democracy is in essence. Those four elements, those things create a stable society. And not only a stable society, but a stable international society. If you have an international order that's based on accountable, inclusive, uh, transparent, responsive institutions, you will have a more, you, and it's essentially what the order has been for 75 years. Not perfect, we could get to that in a moment, but essentially that's the nature of the order. Uh, open, inclusive, you will have a more stable system. And autocrats are simply about maintaining their power uh, in a certain, so democracy matters in very practical ways. And finally, of course, there is no system that affirms human dignity like democracy. You can't have human rights and human dignity without democratic systems and democratic voices. And so you have, I used to, I would get, you know, asked this question recently as head of NDI, you know, young people don't believe in democracy in America. What do you think about that? And I say, I don't believe it. I know they're not happy with how democracy has functioned. Mm -hmm. They don't like the way democracy has delivered. They don't like the fact that American democracy has been imperfect in the extreme in the way that it's marginalized some people and whole groups of people. But democracy means you have a voice. And the I asked young people, do you want a voice in your government? Do you want to hold your government accountable? Do you want to be included? Do you want full inclusivity of all, all citizens equally under law? Then you want democracy. And the problem is that we have weak democracies. Uh, and the answer is to have better democracies, not no democracy. So it is a defining moment, in my view, this moment in time. In some ways, it's, it's a really pivotal moment, um, but it's clarifying. Biden has talked about, President Biden has talked about the competition between autocracy and democracy as a defining challenge of this time. I have a, I've said that for years myself. I've seen that in action. And people will kind of go, ah, yeah, right, whatever. I think now we are seeing that. It is a defining moment. And, p and now you're seeing countries realize they're going to have to take sides on this more, more um, uh, openly. Um, with what, and Russia has now clarified things. And you're seeing what Russia has done, opening up the door 
to the autocratic uh, impulses that are out there. And what he has unleashed is going to be very tough to, be, to put back in the, uh, in the closet, as it were, or back in, the, um, back in control. Uh, and it is going to take all of us to figure out what we are going to do to try to assist that process to see a world that we would like to see in the 21st century. We have to decide what kind of world we want, and it's going to be up to us to fight for it. Well, that's very, very elo eloquent, um, Eric. And I know that um, NDI has been involved in a number of things um, to support democracy. I mean, most people equate uh, NDI's mission with election observer, which is yeah. a, a very minor part of what NDI does. But I know that you've done some really interesting work uh, on the, the aspects of what really challenged democracy, like disinformation and misinformation and the like. Uh, how do you how do you go into a country uh, that is subject to this kind of massive disinformation campaign? I mean, I I, I, I think about what's happening in Russia today, and they're here they're obviously hearing only one side of this war in Ukraine. But social media is such that it's it's almost pervasive, and it's very difficult for governments to to get around it uh, and to, or to block it, I should say. Um, you were very much involved with the administration over the summit for democracy. There, um, a lot of people said, "Oh my goodness, in this day and age, it's kind of naive." And a lot of people were found it easy to criticize the countries that were actually invited. I, I once wrote an article saying I think that, that we should be very liberal about the number of countries that were invited there. But then we had a meeting, and it was mostly over Zoom, and it was a summit meeting. A lot of people participated in it. But what, why was that important, and what has come out of it so to basically to give a, a push to the democracy movement in, mm -hmm. your, in your view? Well, uh, I... Um I, I didn't have a whole lot to do with it. This was a Biden administration. I provided some advice, and much of it was not taken. So it <laughs> for me, for better. <laughs> Typically, if you don't take my advice, it's for the better. But, um, but, you know, I would have liked to have seen. I mean, I was somewhat critical of it, but I do think that it was an important uh, moment in the summit that they had. They were also. I think they were distracted by Afghanistan. They had a lot of things happening last year that that set them back. So they actually. I don't know if you all know. They've announced there'll be another summit this year, at the end of this year, and they've called this year the, the year of action. Mm -hmm. So they asked various countries to commit, mm -hmm. to make voluntary commitments of what they were going to do to uh, defend their own democracy and defend global democracy. And then in a year, they come back and then they brief on what they've done and, and countries can hold them to account. So um, that's the idea behind this. And I think it's good to, to have a moment to celebrate as what I talked about earlier, which is celebrate the system and celebrate the values that we all um, unite around. Uh, the fact is democracies are very all different. I mean, democracy does not come in one form. American democracy is just one kind of democracy. There are certain uh, core elements of democracy that I outlined earlier, the rule of law and transparency and inclusion and all these things, and regular elections and uh, independent judiciary and free media and civil liberty. These are all essential to democracy. But the form of it is quite uh, diverse. And I think having a moment to celebrate these things at a moment where China, Russia, and other liberals are out there both trying to redefine democracy, they actually are redefining it out there, and promoting an illiberal model globally. They're exporting their models of, of governance and saying our model of illiberal governments works. Um, and when you get to the issue of information, I absolutely do believe, you, you hit it in the head, I came in, I saw it firsthand when I was in Burma. I saw how digital was gonna kill democracy. I saw how it was creating division and how it was oppressing Muslims and specifically Rohingya when I was there. So I, I saw it in real time. Um, and um, I believe that information is the lifeblood of a democracy. If you don't. People can't figure out what a fact is. They don't get information. How can you have debates? How can you have discussion? How can you come to a decision for the best interest of a, a country? So information is the lifeblood. And good information integrity is the lifeblood of, of a democracy. So being able to defend that space um, and also be assertive in, in promoting space 
on the dig in the digital realm. Finding a place where it's not just about me, 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 which a lot of the social media is about. It's about listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Uh, and I, you know, I've said, I used to say this when I was ambassador in Burma because there are a lot of kids that I would speak to, young people who are really excited to talk at the American Center. And they'd all talk, I think this, I think that, I think the other. And I said, you know, in Burma, you've had 50 years where you haven't been able to speak. Now everyone wants to speak all at once and tell, this is what I think. And I said, but democracy is not just the right to speak, it's the responsibility to listen and the responsibility to compromise. And social media, and I saw this when I went to uh, Mark Zuckerberg's speech at, at Georgetown. He gave a speech there, and it was, I thought, a dreadful speech um, for a host of reasons. Um, and it was a perfect representation of both him and Facebook because it was him standing on a stage speaking at us. He didn't discuss anything. He didn't have a debate about anything. He didn't have a conversation about it. It was him saying, this is what I think, and talking about how wrapping himself in the mantle of Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King and, and, and free speech. Um, and I found it just abhorrent. It, it was just and irresponsible. We have to find a way for conversation. We have to find a way to come together, and we have to be able to preserve space for information. And the thing is about this, and this is where NDI really comes into the fore, is that we don't have the answers, unfortunately, in the United States. Back when you were doing it, we can say, well, the American model, you know, America at least looked like, and we were never perfect. And I think NDI always was. And as an ambassador, I never suggested America had this right. Uh, America's democracy was perfect at all. But the world needs models, and we were at least a model of how democracies can work, and our power and our success overall was a leverage on other countries to say, yeah, you can achieve your objectives going down this route, and we can give you some lessons learned about it. Um, today, it's much harder to do, though we people around the world still look for it. But what NDI does is share experiences. And in fact, what we're learning is that Estonia, Ukraine, Taiwan, other places when it comes to the information space on countering disinformation, we're doing it much better than we are. And we can now learn from the world. And in fact, I think we can be inspired by the world, which is what I've been trying to also, trying to connect universities. It's an idea I've had, I pitched it to Samantha Power and others. Um, you know, young people here want a voice, there are young people abroad who want a voice, um, and they're fighting for it on the streets around the world. I think people d back here are feeling down. I think you can, if you talk to people in, young people in Ukraine or in Burma or in Thailand or Sudan, or you'll be inspired by their, by what democracy means to them um, and the, the ambitions they have on, on things like climate, et cetera. And I think it's starting to come back at us. So the p seeds that we planted at NDI and that sprouted on their own, this wasn't America doing it, or NDI doing it. These are countries themselves taking ownership of this. We just shared things with them. And then they grabbed it and ran with it. Um, they now can be teaching us some lessons. And I think in this area on information, here's a great space where we have to work together. Um, yeah, that's a very important point. And I can tell you that uh, even from the beginning, we never tried to sell the American system, which is very unique. It's kind of federated system where States have power and the federal government has has power, but uh, there's always tension within the system. And then we have, of course, the Electoral College. Yes, try to sell the Electoral <laughs> College to anybody or explain it to anybody. Uh, unfortunately, a, a number of Latin American countries uh, bought into the notion of separation of powers where the parliament and the presidency would be separate and apparently there would be a check one or the other. But then they changed their electoral system so that um, you were elected on a party line rather than an individual line, which contradicted the whole issue of checks and balances. And, and so uh, people who followed the American model had gotten in themselves into real, real trouble over time. But back to the disinformation. Uh, a few years ago, um, NDI honored one of its partners. Um, her name is Maria Lisa from mm. the Philippines, who just won the Nobel Peace Prize for her work uh, in basically exposing a lot of the, uh, the issues in the Duterte uh, regime uh, within the Philippines. Her, her life is at risk. Uh, she could be imprisoned for what she does. She already has charges against her. 
but that's the kind of partner that NDI has developed over the years. NDI is, is an American organization, yet it isn't. I mean, we have partners every, or we, I would say, because I'm on the board, have partners everywhere, like Maria Reza, uh, who really did earn a Nobel Peace Prize. But this whole issue of disinformation, I don't think there's any more important issue uh, in terms of what threats there are to democracy mm -hmm. today. Give us a little bit of the, the feelings you had or the, 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 the interchanges you had with people like Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar and Burma <coughs> during that period. Uh, it was a period when I think you were still there when the military started to attack the Rohingya villages. Mm -hmm. And so you had uh, this issue of people all of a sudden saying, what happened to Aung San Suu Kyi? She won the Nobel Peace Prize as well, but she doesn't look like she's actually acting that way now. Uh, and you had to deal with that and talk to her about it. And, uh, and I'm sure she was a bit disgruntled about the fact that she'd lost support in the Western world. Um, was it that she saw that the military was so much of a threat that she had to really yield uh, to the military in those days? Or mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about the politics of what you were experiencing when you were in Burma. Right. Um, well, Aung San Suu Kyi was a partner of NDI's too, as other partners are, a remarkable network, and you don't know how they're, you know, how they're going to turn out. And the fact is, she, just to go back, because I get asked the question, do we make a mistake? in investing in Aung San Suu Kyi as a U.S. government or otherwise? My answer is absolutely not because she's the, cho the choice of the Burmese people. Yeah. She was chosen all the way back in 1990 when she was under house arrest for the first time. Um, her party still ran, which was basically represented her, and they won a landslide in 1990. And then she ran again in 2015 when I was ambassador and won a landslide and then ran again in 2020, and they won a landslide. And each time they win the exact same number, almost, in fact, a little bit more. It's slightly more in 2020, I think. And the military each time is stunned, surprised at the result, and go, how can this be? Um, and of course, the latest time they, they decided not to accept it. Um, when I was there, it was a different moment with her. Um, I was there from, I was at the envoy first in 2011, when there was no opening at all. I mean, I arrived there and there was nothing. Uh, I couldn't even use my cell phone, you know, my BlackBerry in those days. I'd have to wait till I got back to, to Bangkok in order to fire that up and get my messages. It was completely backward. I became ba ambassador in 2012 after we saw some, some evolution um, in the country. First one in 22 years. I guess. First ambassador in 22 years. Um, yeah, we had representation there, but it was a, a, a degraded level. Um, but she was always the partner because she was the represent. We knew she represented the, the hopes and dreams of a wide array of the Burmese people. I mean, it's a very divided society. Um, you know, she um, she's somebody who we always knew was <laughs> very headstrong. Um, she took her leadership very seriously. She was the daughter of Aung San, who was the independence leader, kind of the George Washington and the Abraham Lincoln of the country, who was assassinated on the eve of Burmese independence in 1947. She was only two years old. And she was her father's daughter. And she used to say to her husband, I, I someday may have to go back and pick up this mantle. And she actually found herself in the middle of, um, of street demonstrations when she was going back to take care of her sick mother in the late 1980s. So she was a symbol of hope for the country. She still is a symbol of hope to many in the country. And we were investing in that. Um, and I think she took that very seriously, but had a, there's a Burman attitude. They're the majority ethnic ethnicity in the country of Burman, which is a little bit of an um, uh, noblesse oblige kind of, you know, we are, we are better than the rest. And we, we had hoped that she'd be more Burmese or Myanmar rather than Burman, a Burman chauvinist. And I think she showed herself to be a little bit more of a, a Burman than the national leader that we had hoped she would be. But she was the only Aung San Suu Kyi we had or anybody had, and the country had. So they kept investing in her, even when there were questions. Even the ethnic nationalities would invest in her when they weren't sure she was going to speak for them. Um, so it's a highly complicated country. Um, and what happened was, I think, she did try to win over the military. She did try to build some ties to them or show that she can lead um, so that the, when the Rohingya were attacked, 
by the military. And that happened after I left. The, ma the big attack happened. First, there was a major attack in, I think it was November 2016, no, October 2016, then the big one in August 2017. Um, but there, the Rohingya were in camps when I was there. There wasn't a, a sort of um, intercommunal attack in 2012. And I worked on this issue as much as any other issue I worked on during my time, knowing it was a ticking time bomb. Um, but uh, there are very nationalist attitudes in the country, and she had that nationalist attitude that these people were not necessarily part of the natural fabric of the country, that they were seeking maybe some, there were out, outside forces trying to divide the country. Um, and she felt she had to defend the honor of the military, and that was a way for her to gain some support internally. Um, and it just, I think it, it tell a lesson to all of us. I think we all have to recognize that individuals are complex, that politics are complex. Um, it taught me these days as well, we talk about free speech. You give a country free speech, you open it up in 2012, you may not like what they say. <laughs> you know, the country was opened up in 2012, we allowed for free, and then we realized that there was a lot of chauvinism and racism in the country, and that a lot of things have been clamped down, shut down, because of the military uh, domination. Um, but when it opened up, we suddenly saw the complexities of, of this country. So we have to, you know, um, not, there's never an easy transition to any democracy. It is a long, a long process, and it requires a cultural change. That you can build a road, you can even hold an election within a month or two, but you can't change mindsets in the same same length in the mindsets of that country. I need a long, long, much longer time to get to where um, we feel it's democratic. Yeah. Reminds me there were a few people of the neocon persuasion who thought that uh, we could uh, find an Arab country uh, by the name of Iraq and turn it into a democracy overnight. And, and uh, giving them free speech, uh, we, uh, some of those people assumed they would be then very friendly with Israel. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. that didn't happen either. We've made some really serious mistakes. Um, well, as our chair says, our chair of NDI is Madeleine Albright, and right. she says imposing yeah. democracy is an oxymoron. <laughs> you can't impose <laughs> democracy. Right. It has to be from the ground up. It has to be owned by the people. And the right. idea that you can go in with force or impose democracy, which sometimes they'll say about NDI, or we're exporting it or we're pushing yeah. it, or we're not. We're supporting those who themselves right. seek it for their own interests. And it may or may not redound well for the United States. When people speak, you may not like what they say. They may vote for an Aung San Suu Kyi that we don't like, but that's democracy, and they have to work it out for themselves right. by self-correcting over time. And that's just the, the strength and the weakness of democracy. Just to put a final uh, point on the Burma-Myanmar uh, situation, there's basically a civil war going on there now. The military is very strong, but the people are be becoming armed. I don't know who's arming them. I don't know what role the Chinese are playing there and what their concerns are. Tell me, bring us up to date, and, and uh, it's a pretty tragic situation. And, and how is it going to resolve itself? Uh, it's hard to see how it resolves itself. It's really hard, just like Ukraine, you could say it's hard to see how this ends. When things start, I mean, it's, it's interesting how both, I would say, Putin and the Burmese military miscalculated egregiously. They didn't expect the response they got. And it is something to reflect on is why um, these illiberal, autocratic, violent powers feel that they can do these. Why are they miscalculating as they are? Um, the Burmese military, I think, felt that they could get away with this, that they thought that maybe the international community was down on Aung San Suu Kyi, that we may not, you know, care so much at this point. Um, if they said we are, we'll back the West against China because they don't like China. The Burmese military does not like, the Burmese people do not like China. One of the reasons they opened up to us when I was envoy and then ambassador, I think, was because they wanted to balance against Chinese influence, which is overweening in the country. It's neo-colonial in the country. Um, so, you know, they, um, but they did what they did. There is now, I mean, the people, they thought, would not, respond that maybe people were down on democracy even Aung San Suu Kyi. But they didn't realize there's a new generation. I mentioned young people earlier, and this is their moment. Um, the older generation kind of said, oh, goodness, here we go again. 
we had about 50 years of, of military dictatorship, we're back again. The younger generation said, you messed with the wrong generation. <laughs> we, we spent 10 years with a taste of freedom, with, and, uh, you know, uh, with being networked, opened up to Facebook. It's a Facebook country. Opened up to uh, free media, to educational opportunities, to uh, just a whole different environment. Um, and they weren't willing to go back. They just did not, they were not going to have that future snuffed out. And they took to the streets, and they've gotten the weapons, and they're fighting back, and they're now allying. And now these are the Burmans that are doing it. This is in the heartland. In the past, the ones who were fighting the military were the ethnic nationalities, the minority areas in the periphery, in the mountains, and the edges. But now it's the core Burmans who, who interestingly are saying, now we get it. The Rohingya were warning us. They say this. They say, Rohingya were saying this, and we didn't believe them about the military. Or the Kachin, another ethnic group in the Northeast, they were saying this, and we didn't believe them. Now we believe them. We now have to work together to fight this evil force of the military together. And so the, and they're just fighting for their futures and their lives in every, every village. Um, and it is heartbreaking to watch the violence, the impunity they have every day, villages being burned, children being killed, people just in the military with impunity just shooting people around the country when they want to, people on motorbikes just shooting them. Um, given what I saw and what I know about the people of, of the country. It's horrific. Um, but the military is like Putin. They can't, they will never admit they failed or they made a mistake. I'm not sure Putin thinks he made a mistake, but if you get to a point, at any point, where there's, you know, we're not sure that information is flowing to the autocrat. Um, we don't know if they care because they can't admit a mistake and therefore they're gonna fight to the death. And then you have on the other side folks who are also going to fight for their liberties. To the, and how that gets reconciled is very hard to, to imagine. Even in, um, even in Burma, uh, in Ukraine, it's very dangerous to imagine how this can, uh, how this can play out. Um, in, in Burma, it's going to be contained generally within Burma, but it is on the edge of being a failed state. Um, and I think the, the military is at the point of destroying the country to save themselves, and somewhat like Syria and Assad. Um, so it's very, very sad and tragic, and it's, it's very painful to, to even watch. I think we are going to get into Ukraine a little more uh, uh, later, but let's stay in Asia for a while. Uh, um, we have in the audience uh, the former uh, Consul General in Hong Kong, uh, Ambassador Richard Boucher up in the back there. But you were in Hong Kong um, a year and a half ago, or two years ago, mm -hmm. just before the real crackdown. Um, and before the pandemic, yeah. And before the pandemic. <laughs> so it's more than two, two well, and a half years. That's right. Talk a bit about uh, Hong Kong. Um, here, here we have, have uh, people, Chinese people, that were raised in a very different cultural environment. They were, in some ways, anglicized, I suppose, but they certainly were raised with, with democratic values. How successful can China be in really suppressing uh, those, uh, those basic instincts of democracy and freedom and freedom of speech? So far, pretty successful, I'd say. Yeah, in the short term, they certainly can. They have control of Hong Kong. It is their turf, and they are doing everything they possibly can to destroy any remnant of free thinking, free speech, freedom liberty at all uh, in, in that um, territory. Uh, they want to preserve the, the economic investments there, but I'm not sure you can if you're going to destroy free speech um, and free flow of information. Um, but they're willing to do it because I think Xi Jinping thinks Hong Kong is not as important as it was in the past. Um, and he is on the he believes that um, China is ascendant. No one is going to do anything about it and that their form of governance um, is the only way to go for their country. Um, so I, you know, but the, you can't snuff out human ambition to speak. Um, you know, I th even the Chinese people, um, despite living in a, an increasingly a surveillance state, an Orwellian state, the, the technologies today allow for Orwell's vision to be, um, to be realized where everything you do is watched, surveyed, 
and um, you're held accountable for. Um, it's chilling. Um, and it will be up to the Chinese people to figure a way, if they choose, to uh, oppose that. Right now, uh, Xi Jinping is playing on nationalism. That's his way to say this, that China has risen. We are powerful in not only nationalism, but the great lifeblood of nationalism, which is grievance and victimization. And I've always felt that any country whose national identity is based on victimization is a country you have to worry about. And but many countries do have that. I'd said that for 20, 20 years, 25, I mean, as long as I can probably sitting in your chair as I, uh, you witness this. Um, the Chinese taught their people victimization. I mean, systematically. I worked in the Pentagon in the late 1990s. I was on the China desk. And there was all this ambition and vision of, uh, in those days it was called in the Clinton administration, as everyone remember, building toward a constructive strategic partnership with China. And I was always skeptical. And I told my minders to say, we should go to China and say, the only way we can ever have a constructive strategic partnership with you is if you stop telling your people that the United States is the enemy, <laughs> you know, the US and Japan have divided you, have assisted in a century of humiliation, are the fount of all our problems, and use us as, um, as a, a focal point for, uh, for grievance. Uh, in, in their media and in their, um, and in their um, uh, well, yeah, media and, and TV and such, newspapers and TV. And so we're seeing the result of that kind of grievance play out. And so people think Hong Kong, well, you're, anything Western is anti-Chinese. It's a, it's a triumphal moment where China has not just stood up, it is now time to rejuvenate. Um, and Hong Kong is part of that, and as long as, um, you know, we don't have the ability to, to do much about that now. So I think what we try to do is assist those elsewhere and show China that, that democ democracy can deliver. China is able to make its case because democracies have been on its, their back foot. We have been divided. We have been inefficient, ineffective. And we've been given juice to Chinese and others to say, we can't afford that. Um, otherwise, we'll have chaos. Uh, or we don't like that because we will not have, will not be strong. Uh, we have to prove ourselves that it works. Otherwise, we don't give hope to others. I have recently uh, taken on a project in Washington to try to support the U.S. getting back into UNESCO, the United Nations Science, Education, and Cultural Organization, where a lot of really interesting work is being done on uh, artificial intelligence and trying to create an ethical guidelines which has been adopted by the 193 members of UNESCO, including the Chinese, despite the fact that they uh, argued uh, that governments ought to be able to surveil their own people. But in the end, um, w which was not part of the uh, document that was approved, the Chinese found themselves being the only country uh, that would not have uh, signed off on that, uh, on, the, on those ethical guidelines. So they did, in the end, signed off, sign off on it. And now they're joining these institutions, changing those rules, getting allies, well, you, you uh, and mean, then and selling surveillance in a box to countries around yeah, the world. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. But it, <clears throat> UNESCO is a place, it seems to me, where the United States ought to be. Yes. So that I we agree. can basically promote those kinds of uh, values and, and even the guidelines. Uh, China has a, has a real uh, problem with soft power, um, as I think you've acknowledged, and now that they've joined with Russia in a very interesting uh, agreement, which, which builds on the so-called Shanghai uh, communique, where a number of countries that were sort of illiberal or authoritarian joined together as well against the West. But it must be very awkward now for, for China now to, to observe what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Uh, how they sell that to the rest of the world and just further undermines their, whatever goodwill they were seeking in the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, for example, or whatever goodwill they seek uh, by participating in organizations like UNESCO. I think it's gonna be a challenge for them. Yeah, I think they don't quite, they've never understood what soft power really means. So, and to the degree they have soft power, they try to do it through the, the demonstration of their economic success. So that they can say, you can, you can be as successful as we, and look how we've governed, it works. Or look how we've done things, it works, and you can be. 
Um, but in other ways, if, if soft power is about being attractive. It's not something you can, you can do aggressively. It's something that you've earned from other countries uh, through your media, through your values, through your, through your people, through your citizens, I'm and not how sure they. That act. Some of the movies that we put out uh, are attractive to people, but not no, no, movies. but but people do. Unfortunately, the ones that you may not be attracted to, others might. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the shoot 'em up movies sure. are the. I so there, it's a weird thing that people love Hollywood, or they're like you know. Or, or they, they appreciate certain the values that America has stood for and what things represent, the Marvel and, you know, Captain America and good and evil, all that. Um, there's an attractiveness to that. And China, I think, tries to sell its economic model, but in every other way, in the way they've done things, it really isn't about soft power. It's about hard power. It's about having a nice glove with a fist under it and saying, do it this way or we're, and, or we'll hurt you or we'll give you something, but it'll come at a cost. Everything comes, so it's buyer beware. If you want to get a road, get, you know, great, get a road from China. The places need infrastructure. Nothing wrong with that. But recognize they often are buying. They're not selling. They're getting that, and they're going to have leverage over you by doing these things. Um, and that's their version. And I, I have a different term. I, I'd heard, I think, 10 years ago. Never sort of caught on. But now you have, you have hard power. You have soft power. There's talk of sharp power. I always talked about sticky power, where sticky power is the economic power, the, the mutual interdependence, or which is redundant, interdependence, um, between the economics does. Or when you have, maybe it's even uh, when you sell weapons and you have an inter interdependent military. But it's that kind of power where you have leverage simply through your interactions. And I think China uses sticky power. Um, and then once you're sticks, maybe it's like spider power because you, you have sticky power and then they, and then they have sharp power. Once right. they got you in there in a web, they get you the, with sharp power and they use them together. Uh, spider power, the Spider-Man theory of Chinese power. Um, so anyway, this is so you see that all over the place and Australia and countries are waking up to it. So as one by one, countries are waking up to the cost of these relationships and the interactions with China. It's not having, it's had the opposite of soft power effects. It's having very negative effects on the international image of China, but China doesn't seem to care, or Xi Jinping doesn't seem to care. There's probably others in China who do. But again, this is another example of where increasingly autocratic regimes don't get the information they need and can do self-destructive or counterproductive things. This is not working well for China. And no one's gonna tell Xi Jinping that. Uh, what's happening is not good for Russia but no one's gonna tell Putin that, and it's gonna ca uh, cause enormous harm. No one's gonna tell Min Aung Hlaing in Burma or some of the leadership in Burma because he doesn't wanna know or they don't wanna know. Um, this is the danger when you allow for autocracy, and the result is incredible destruction, is vast in destruction. So we don't say that with gleefully as small d Democrats. We say it with great despair that um, this is the result. When you put your trust, it, it comes at a cost. Okay. Uh, we're going to turn to questions. I just want to make one final observation of, about my own experience with NDI. I uh, was invited to go to Taiwan many years ago by the KMT, the then ruling party, Kuomintang. And, uh, I wasn't invited by them, actually. I was invited by the opposition, which was not legal at the time. And they asked me to give a speech, and uh, Congressman Steve Solars had given a speech, a speech there a, a year earlier in a hotel conference room of about 100 people. I thought that's what it was going to be. It turned out that they had set this up as a, a speech in a football stadium where about 30,000 people were present. <laughs> And I was called into the foreign ministry and asked not to give the speech. And I said, well, my understanding is that your government has given them permission. You've given them a license to hold this meeting. Well, that's true. And I said, well, you can always withdraw the license if you don't want me to speak. Oh, no, that would be too controversial. Anyway, we agreed that the American delegation would not sit on the stage with me. I gave the speech. And uh, the next week, that uh, opposition party declared itself to be the, the current ruling party, the Democratic Party of Progressive Taiwan. Yeah. Now, NDI has just established a regional office in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Isn't that provocative? Aren't you kind of sticking it to the Chinese a little bit by doing that? 
No, we don't intend to. I, I mean, I, I've been a longtime supporter of Taiwan because, um, you know, it, things we do, it, this is about Taiwan, it's not about China. And they are a democracy, and actually the leading democracy in Asia. So Taiwan so, isn't part of China, is that what you're saying? Well, de facto, it's not right now. We don't take a position on who's part of what. The, the Beijing does not control Taipei, uh, and Taipei has developed a democracy. So we feel that sure. having a, um, putting stakes there and doing work in the region that promotes uh, democratic norms and free speech is what we're about. We're not looking to change China. We're not using it as a launching point to subvert the mainland. Right. We're simply using it as a place to build solidarity among what is, you know, the people of Taiwan, the people of, there are people of Hong Kong there, um, people of Burma, opposition, and with Japan, with Korea, with Australia, with India, the de democracies of Asia, to affirm that these values are actually um, consistent with um, global interest and our interest in, in justice. And consistent, this is the way I explained it to the People's Republic uh, ambassador when I got back to Washington and he called me in to admonish me. And I said, well, hopefully uh, we still believe in a one China policy, but if, you, if you're if you both democratic, you'll be e more easily able to work out you know, the, the relationship. Yeah, and actually our one China policy is those who know that we've studied this a lot. We don't take, the US government doesn't take a position on whether Taiwan is part of China. Um, so this is an open question of what, whether it's part or not. Um, yeah, well, all right, let's open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, well, no, 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 I'm sorry. You have to use a microphone. Yeah, yeah. okay, sorry. Uh -huh. I, uh, I have a good question is uh, these last several days when this conflict between Ukraine and Russia erupted, uh, all the media and everything you're talking about uh, is uh, no one has actually said anything about Russia's side of the story because democracy, there's two sides of the story. The way I gather this is uh, the main issue that Russia has that uh, they don't want to be uh, 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 interfered with NATO taking over uh, Ukraine and, and the European Union so they feel threatened by that. And that's why they're taking this drastic step, I think, and, uh, but I don't know much more about that rather than, uh, could you please elaborate on this why? Uh, I mean, try to, I know, uh, I agree with what you're saying. I agree everything in the democracy, but there's always something that why Putin would take such drastic uh, measures because it seems like it, his country, Russia, has been diminished somewhat since the Soviet Union, like you mentioned, and they seem like they want to be independent country and they don't want to be interfered by either uh, NATO or, U or U.S. United States or European Union. So, uh, can you please uh, just explain that more elaborate? Yeah. yeah well, you, as, as you say, that yeah. that is what Putin has said. He has asserted that it's uh, they're again victimized. They have a grievance that they're being they're not being respected. Um, but the fact is, Ukraine is an independent country with an independent democracy that is wants to have a say in its own future. Um, and I think Putin. Uh, is not so interested in the NATO factor or the EU factor, and he's been actually explicit about this right uh, before or the day of the uh, before the invasion, which is that he views Ukraine as not even a country. He views it this is an accident of history, in his view, that is a result, interestingly, of the Bolsheviks, as he said, of Lenin, uh, and of allowing Ukraine to be some, a separate entity, but that it should be part of Russia and that in his view, which is a, a, a wrong view, erroneous view of history, that it, that it always has been part of Russia. In fact, Kiev, Kiev Rus formed, I mean, there was a, a Ukraine, a Kiev before there was a Russia. Um, there is cultural and linguistic and personal connection between the two sides, between Ukraine and Russia. But Ukraine has its own identity, has its own culture, has its own um, territory. Um, and whatever Putin's concerns, if they truly are about security, about encroachment of NATO or encroachment of the EU, he can have a conversation about that if he wants to. And the fact is NATO's encroachment has not been at the expense of Russia. Nothing about NATO has been seeking to undermine Russia's development, Russia's interests. Um, there's been no provocation here at all from Ukraine or otherwise. So if he has a concern or a suspicion, he can raise that diplo diplomatically. We can work on that, as folks have. But it's not really about that. 
I think he even said it's not really about that. It's about his vision for himself, his own legacy, as maybe the new czar to create a new imperium, Russian imperium that includes um, Ukraine. I don't want to say Russian czar, but at least to create a new imperium um, that um, that should rightfully be Russia, um, and with no interest whatsoever in the interests of the Ukrainian people, and to do it perhaps at a time when he thought there was an opportunity, when maybe the West was divided, when he thought the West was weak, when he had China on his side, uh, and he thought uh, he might be able to get away with it. We don't know. It's an absolute result of a megalomaniacal um, madman, basically, and the destruction, and what he's gotten into is um, it's going to be highly destructive for, for, for all of us. I would also point out that in the early days of enlargement, which, if you will, during the Clinton administration, and I was part of that administration, uh, there were real efforts to try to get the uh, Russians to participate with NATO. In fact, there were joint military exercises. There was something called the Partnership for Peace, where Russia would actually come to Brussels and meet with NATO members. And if uh, Russia had taken advantage of that kind of relationship with NATO, there wouldn't be a NATO today. Uh, they would have been part of it. They would have been part of the security architecture of Europe. Um, I, I do then think after that effort was made and it didn't succeed, the next administration, of course, then did some things that really did perhaps uh, tweak the tail of the tiger by abrogating the ABM Treaty and, and inviting Georgia and Ukraine to join NATO and uh, placing intermediate nuclear weapons in, in countries that were former uh, Warsaw Pact members. And that, anti that was antagonistic. But the fact of the matter is, and I agree absolutely with Derek, the real threat to Putin's kleptocracy is the fact that there is a democracy in a former Soviet state on his border that has now had 30 years of experience that is beginning to root out corruption. Hasn't done it yet entirely, but no one has. Um, and that was more threatening, it seems to me, to Putin than NATO, uh, it, it seems. I mean, Putin and Xi have talked about uh, how there are different cultures, and democracy isn't, needs to be adjusted to all cultures, which is somewhat true. But they say that it's not really consistent and the values, these values of liberalism are not consistent with Russian or Chinese culture. Well, Ukraine has, a, has Russian influence and Russian influence culture. It's not completely a Russian culture, but it's culturally affiliated. And they seem to say, we like these values of the West, of the EU, of NATO. Taiwan's another example. They're saying, they're of Chinese culture, and they say, we don't, we don't have to be like China. We can be a democracy, we can be open. These places are fundamental challenges to Xi Jinping and, and Vladimir Putin's image and their power. And they must be snuffed out in order to say, oh no, see that wasn't real. They don't really exist. They're not actual different. Um, you know, we're really, so East and West uh, is the way they like to look at it. And what we're talking about is a more universal attitude that we've witnessed. Doesn't matter if they're, you're in Latin America or Africa or Europe or Asia, people want to have a voice. People want to speak. They want to have account the governments that, that are held accountable in different forms, in different natures. Some want more strong government. Some people want more weak government. But generally, human beings want these uh, general values. And they can decide for themselves, ultimately, what is right culturally for themselves uh, and don't need outside powers to tell them what to do. Uh, I want to ask about the U.S.'s role in addressing and defending democracy worldwide. Uh, you mentioned that democracies have a responsibility to protect each other and to listen to each other, and that it's been partly a failure of this that's led to these autocracies rising. Um, but I'm also wondering to what degree should they act and to what degree should they be respecting the other country's sovereignty and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, for the U.S. specifically, we also have a lot of history of anti-democratic policies, both domestically and uh, in foreign policy, overturning some governments uh, or invading Iraq, obviously. So I'm curious, like, how can we make sure that we act responsibly and credibly? Uh, should we act at all, or is it important to let others lead? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, and there's a history in the early Cold War of overturning governments. That was of its time. The issue of Iraq, I think <laughs> it's, we have to model, if we want to promote certain values, we have to model them. And Iraq was a huge setback, frankly. I remember I, it was my, between times at NDI was the Iraq War. So I left NDI in 97, Iraq War happened in early 2000. And I remember thinking at that time, I would hate to be working in NDI now <laughs> because everyone, you know, people would assert NDI is about, this is what democracy promotion is. It's about imposing democracy. It's about, you know, uh, toppling governments. And that's not what democracy support work, and that's how we like to talk about it. Democracy support, not democracy in position. Even democracy promotion sometimes can seem too aggressive, though I, I don't have a problem with that. But what we do is democracy support. Um, so when there is something like this, uh, where we are using military force to topple a government and violate a sovereignty, there are a lot of questions occur about hypocrisy and it undermines our, our ability to influence others and to be a model for others. You know, so there is that. Our actions domestically and internationally have never been perfect. I mean, in because we have global responsibilities, we may do things that cross a line in a certain way in our own defense or in the defense of certain um, norms internationally or security values internationally. That's the art of foreign policy. I think we have to be very careful in the way we pull certain levers because of what, exactly what you say. Uh, domestically, as I said, I think being, NDI never goes, and when I was ambassador, you know, it was the Obama administration. And I used to tell them when I would talk about racial differences and how do you overcome divisions, uh, religious differences, I said, I don't need to be lecturing you. I'm not lecturing you. I'm, I'm giving you a lesson learned because you can look on CNN and watch a black man being shot in the streets, you know, and we have racial problems in the United States. Even though we have a black president, these things are happening. But we know we're weaker when we are divided. And this is the lesson. So don't, and I would tell the Burmese, I'd say, you, have, you sh used to be the rice bowl of Asia. You, they used to be the largest exporter of rice in the world in the 1950s, early 1950s, maybe some of the time. They were, they were the rice bowl of Asia. Um, they had, um, they had uh, English-speaking population, you know, the British colonial. They had the university that all of Southeast Asia would go to. If you got a degree in medicine at Rangoon University, you could practice in London. I mean, this is the Burma that came out of uh, colonialism in the 1950s. Everything ran through there. All the airlines would run through Burma. It wouldn't run through you know, Singapore like it does now. And now they're a basket case. And it's because they've been fighting themselves. They've been running. It's the longest running civil war in the world. Since basically independence, they've been fighting this internal battle. And the military then affected a coup in, that, in the name of civil war and instability. And they're now go, go, go from a rice bowl to a basket case. So I would say I'm not lecturing you. I'm telling you. I'm showing you what you, you, you yourself have learned. You're fighting yourself. You're dividing. And dividing will create uh, weakness. And America is weaker for this. So we have to take our lessons and tell them we're not perfect. Democracy is not perfect. Democracy is imperfect. Democracy is hard. This stuff has to be defended by every generation. Um, and it, it requires citizens. It's a job. It's a job of citizens to protect it. Otherwise, it will drift. And it will get. So I didn't sell them a bill of goods. I didn't try and sell them that this was anything magical. Um, but they learned themselves that this was probably the right for them. They came to the decision that they were willing to invest in it because they knew that any alternative was worse. The old Winston Churchill line, right, of democracy is the worst form of government ever created by man except for all the others. I mean, it's not, you look at it and go, this doesn't work. Yeah, well, give me a better one. Uh, and usually it's not working because it's probably not efficient enough or it's not as strong, as, as real a democracy as it should be and can be. The other point I would make is that NDI's uh, basically a tactic is to bring in people from other countries that have gone through democratic transitions that are themselves supportive and understand how those transitions have taken place so that it isn't Americans uh, speaking to them, it's, it's people from a number of countries that are talking to them about various alternatives for democratic institutions. So. 
80, I, I counted up, 85%, at least at the time, more than 80% of our country offices around the world, and we have more than 50, 55, 56, um, are run, led by non-Americans. I mean, a vast majority. And then the vast majority of these offices are staffed by locals. So this is not America, Grant. It's they themselves that are owning this. There are some questions over here, I think, yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, I'm a senior at Brown studying international relations. Um, you talked a little bit about, I guess, like China's identity is um, like basing it on victimization. And I know that like Russia and China, a lot of their like diplomatic alliance is kind of based on this anti-Western like victimization kind of mindset. I was wondering like based on that, Mm, what do you take from like China's statements on Ukraine or like the lack thereof really um, and their response to that? They're in a tough place. Um, and I think they, uh, they feel they need to side with Russia. They just signed an agreement or a, a joint statement with Russia that says that we are with each other through essentially thick and thin. And then Putin, and I'm not sure they knew that Putin was going to attack. Um, I. I doubt it. I'm not sure a lot of people really knew what his intentions were, and they kept saying, we don't think he's going to. Um, and then they're stuck. And so they blame the United States conveniently because they realize it is a clarifying moment. It's a defining moment. Um, and they've, they haven't sided entirely with Russia. They simply condemn the United States, which is always the easy place to go. And then going 30,000 foot and saying, we need to uh, get back to diplomacy and peace and all of that, all these platitudes. Um, but uh, it's now, I don't think they want a situation of clarity where it is about autocracy versus democracy. Then there's more rallying around Taiwan. What they really care about is Taiwan. They don't care what happens in Europe. They actually had a lot of trade with Ukraine. There's a lot at stake for China economically in Ukraine, but and particularly on food. They need the soy, they need the, you know, stuff for their, their own uh, purposes. But they think day and night about Taiwan and anything that makes it more complicated for that. Now, some think West is now distracted West, you know, in Ukraine, and therefore um, they may have a free hand to go for Taiwan. I'm not sure that's how they're thinking. There's no indication that that's where they're moving. Uh, this is a tough year for the Chinese. They have their party Congress, and I don't think it's the right time to do it. They're not ready. Um, but, um, you know, they're struggling with with how to handle a um, very dicey situation. I know what he's going to say is that it's really shuffled the deck broadly. I mean, look at what's happened in Europe, where you have the Germans have broken their um, restrictions on arms sales and a lot of things that have been in place since World War II. Uh, you have the Finns and the Swedes, who have now turned overnight, popular opinion has moved to joining NATO. Um, you have Switzerland, Switzerland now not, not neutral uh, anymore. Um, countries are realizing they've got to stand up and cl clarify where they stand in this defining moment. And, the, um, and those who don't, I think the Indians are trying to straddle right now. I had lunch with the Indian ambassador yesterday. It's about 20 of us. And he was quite defensive about, uh, about because India has a long-standing relationship with Russia. There's a lot at stake in maintaining that can understand all of that, but it is a defining moment for those who, uh, you know, for who's going to be on what side of this question of international order in the UN system. And if they're not on the right side of it now, what do they see in the future if they don't have that to fall back on? Um, I don't think China really wants that right now. They want stability. They want peace. They want to get through this year in their party Congress safely um, and then deal with this on their timeline, not anyone else's. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Andrew. I'm also a senior here at Brown studying international and public affairs. Um, and my question um, is that, like, you're an expert in democracy abroad, uh, but you also mentioned that there's a connection between democracy abroad and kind of what we do at home um, yes. in the United States. Um, how we may not be the model for everyone, but we're an example. Yes. Uh, so I'm thinking, like, sometimes drastic action is needed to protect democracy from those that use it to subvert it. Um, 
sometimes action is more harmful to democracy and based on lies like what we saw on January 6th. But I also think of times where action wasn't taken, like in the case of the Weimar Republic in the early 20th century. Um, so in an American specific context, what is or was your opinion of abolishing the filibuster at home specifically to pass voting rights? Do you see that as a protection of democracy or as uh, a way, yeah, protection of democracy or a subversion of it? Mm -hmm. I speak not as NDI because we don't take positions here. It's always delicate because of our the support we get from Congress and all the rest. Um, but clearly, as an American, um, I personally have. Uh, I mean, filibuster is I, I'm right where the Democratic Party is. I mean, and not just because they're there, but because that's how I feel. Filibuster is a legacy of a of a really not a not a, a bright spot in American history of um, Jim Crow days and the last bastion of, of Southern uh, resistance to civil rights. Um, I don't think our founders wanted to, intended there to be a supermajority to pass anything uh, in the United States. The election should matter, and you shouldn't have to have a 60 vote margin to get anything done, uh, in particular on voting rights. I think it was a crisis, absolute crisis in the United States when it comes to democracy. When it comes to voting rights, when it comes to filibuster, even when it, uh, when it comes to uh, gerrymandering, and I would say um, that that representation is starting to become lost in America, that people's voice is not being represented uh, in the corridors of power uh, in a number of different ways of, of, um, uh, of uh, defining that. But, um, and- Including money in politics. Including money, exactly, is where I was, you know, I was thinking. It was money, but also in just you know, the votes out there. You have my, because of the way things are divided and. Um, and legacies of 18th century life, like the electoral college system. Um, you're not having representative uh, political leaders in Washington. And it's also leading to extremes, extreme voices. You're not getting the centrist voices uh, in the mix. And I say that for Republicans and Democrats. And I try to urge my Republican friends to see the value of changing, of trying to uh, um, reform the system. Uh, at least Republicans who I know who do not like where the Republican Party has moved and is moving, what's happening in America, that can be addressed through voting rights. Then things can be come to the middle and, and have a real debate on, on policy. And I bet you that a lot of the traditional constituencies that vote Democratic would probably go Republican if it were towards the middle, and maybe some Republicans would go Democrat. And you'd have, but it would be a, a real debate. Um, and be healthy, but I don't see that happening, and I think the filibuster is an obstacle. Yes. We did have a. a can I ask an online? We had a uh, question from an online viewer, Derek, who actually picks up on the point you just raised. Uh, the online viewer asks: If we look at the trajectory of the of the Republican Party in particular, and Donald Trump's brand of uh, what the questioner terms authoritarianism, how can the U.S. lead? in democracy, and how can the U.S. reassure allies that the U.S. won't head down the path of isolationism and potentially authoritarianism? To be honest, we can't. I mean, if I were, if I were in government, I'd do what the Biden administration has done, which is to reassure folks that America is back, that uh, alliances <laughs> matter, that uh, the long national nightmare of alienation with the world and America first, which means America alone and America the selfish. Um, is over, and you know, but the world is skeptical, um, and they want to see it, and they don't know that if they make a deal today, that it would uh, be, um, it, it might be abrogated later. Uh, how I've talked about it, though, and I've talked to Europeans in my, where I sit, said it's not a matter of putting your, uh, of betting which side is right. The world has to, and I think they're finding it now, the world has to decide. Europeans have to decide what side you're on. Where do you want to put your finger on the scales? You have to work with America to try to encourage us to move in a certain direction, but we can't be certain about where America is headed. I'm very worried about where America is headed and where 2024 might take us and where the Republican Party has gone. Um, it is not a democratic, you know, small-d democratic uh, party. It's, you have to be able to debate on the facts. You have to be able to accept truth. Politics should stop at a certain point uh, and not cross into anything goes and playing to the most um, divisive elements of society. 
Uh, when I was uh, with NDI, we had uh, the opposite problem. <coughs> countries, small countries in particular that were making the transition, would say to us, how can you uh, come here and teach us about democracy? You're, you're the ultimate. You're the best democracy in the world. You're the, we don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> we now have credibility. We can go see. We have the That's same right. problems you have. That's I mean, right. We have people that are <laughs> anxious yeah. to become authoritarian as well. And we've got populists. And <laughs> we've got disinformation. And we've got big lies. So, but so we can relate to one another and uh, with credibility. Now, what I've <laughs> learned, it was interesting. It was with NDI that I, I mean, I learned it a bit when I worked for Ted Kennedy back in the '80s too. But I learned it when I was with NDI and would travel and talk to jurists and others around the world was just why Amer how much America mattered. You know, there was a little bit, when I was in college in the Reagan years, there was so much self-hugging and we're the best and we're wonderful and you almost couldn't criticize America without seeming like you were a traitor, you know? Um, and which kind of, I loved my country, but I felt like criticizing your leader or criticizing the country is okay. Um, and it's what makes America great. Um, but I have to say, when, as I talked to, I got calls in from all over the world when you worked for Ted Kennedy, or when I spoke to a pa Pakistani jurist before the Pakistan elections in 93, they would say things like, if you can't make it work, we have no chance. <laughs> we have to have a model. And I'm not saying this as an American. I'm saying it as others have said. They said, we want to believe in you. You've got you've to solve your problem so that we can, you, you can lead, you can be a model, we can aspire to that. And if you can't demonstrate it, we feel like we can't do it. And it always inspired me to believe this is a chart. This is not arrogance. This is actually responsibility if we care about this stuff. And I always think that about power. You can see being in government as power or see it as a res responsibility. And I think that this is about responsibility of power that we have to do that, but we are failing on that score. And it's not just a failure for others. It's a failing that will have an impact on American interests. Um, in the average American life. I think we're uh, about out of time, but I, I just want to end by making one comment about democracy. Clearly, Derek has demonstrated uh, very eloquently that it matters. But I also would make the point that democracy is a journey, that there isn't uh, anywhere on the face of this earth, including the United States, that we've reached perfection. And we're always striving for that. and. Uh, the key to it, in, in my mind, is accountability. The governments feel accountability, ac accountable to the people. And what institutions exist in order to fulfill that, that need of people to have their voice heard? Uh, accountability. And uh, remember that democracy is a journey, not a destination. So thank you very much, Derek. It's thank you, Brian. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.